this morning we're going to be reading from the gospel according to John. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. John writes this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light. But the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from human blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The Word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks this morning for your holy word. We give you thanks for your Holy Spirit. And we ask this morning as we turn to your word that that your spirit that dwells in your living word commune with that very same spirit that you've placed in us. And that through this time of communion that, that you would work in us in such a way that transforms us to become the people that you have created us to be. Lord, this morning I pray for a clarity of thought. I pray that, that when I speak, it be your words. Lord, I believe, I believe that you have for us a better way. And I pray that you hide me behind your cross this morning so that your glory, honor, and strength, that your better way would be revealed. We pray all this in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Well, this morning, we find ourselves at the end of the uh, sermon series that we entitled The Poor. Uh, Four weeks ago, we started out talking about uh, physical needs. We looked at the passage of Scripture that talks about how when you uh, feed someone that's hungry, in essence, you're feeding Jesus. And when you provide drink for someone that's thirsty, in essence, you're providing drink for Jesus. And, And when you provide shelter clothing for someone in need of shelter clothing, that you're doing this for Jesus. And so we started with a very physical, the, the very physical needs. And we, and we began to understand that, that this is a very spiritual thing. It's, it's physical needs for others, but it's a spiritual thing for us. And then, so then from there, we began to look at some of the, uh, the, the not so obvious effects uh, or ways that we experience poverty. And the first one we looked at was powerlessness, that people begin to find themselves in a situation where they just don't have power, the power to, uh, to really, well, set their own course a lot of times. And, and they just find themselves in particular situations. And, and we try to really understand that powerlessness is something that we too experience. Even if we never experience some of the physical needs, we still at times in our lives experience this idea of powerlessness. And then we, and then we continue to spiral down, if you will. And, we, and last week we looked at this idea of I have no name. And we began to realize that for some people they have experienced powerlessness for so long that they're beginning to actually lose human identity. It, it may be something that they themselves have come to a, a, an awareness of, or it may just be something that it's being forced onto them. 
uh, because we talked about last week that whenever somebody is striving to go up the ladder, they have to have backs to climb on. And so we, we talked about that. Well, this week we find ourselves at rock bottom. We find ourselves in a place where we're going to look at what it means to stand up one day and say, I have no hope. It's hopeless. Now, several years ago, I had the opportunity, I was invited by the director of this organization called VORP to, to come with her to court and to just spend a day with her. And then, and then she was trying to uh, get me to volunteer with the organization and also to try to uh, encourage my congregation at the time to get involved. And, and what VORP stood for was Vecta, Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. Victim Offender Reconciliation program. And what they would do is they would, they would work with the court systems and if somebody had been arrested for something that they, that the court deemed uh, it was possible that they could sort of work it out and maybe avoid jail time. You know, it wasn't one of these things where it was just so heinous that they, that, that this was the only, you know, that, that prison was going to be the only, oper the only option. This was something that maybe they had just made a mistake and, and they had to have an opportunity to be reconciled. Let me ask you this before we go on. Who in here has ever done something dumb? Okay, right, yeah. And so um, in Sunday school, I asked that question, and, and my wife said she could probably name something dumb I did this morning. Um, and, uh, and then just to prove her right, I said something dumb uh, after Sunday school class, which didn't go over so well, but um, something along the lines about homemade cookies. So anyway... But we do things dumb. We say things dumb. We don't, it doesn't make us dumb. We just sometimes make mistakes. And so VORP, what it was, was this idea that they understood that sometimes people just make mistakes and they need an opportunity to just sit down and talk about it. And so what they wanted to do uh, was not to punish somebody, but to try to, uh, try to provide a way for reconciliation to take place. And so... So what she did is I went with her to court and I got to sit and I got to watch people come in and, and watch how the court process worked. And then some of them were given to, uh, they were, they were uh, told that they needed to work with VORP and there was counselors that had been trained on how to work through the reconciliation program. And then so after we had that opportunity, then she wanted to take me to another court later that afternoon. And, and so where I got to see uh, the one end where people were just sort of starting to come into the system, then I got to go see some of those that had been in the system for a while. And this was the court where when you walk in, you're instructed, do not look at the people that are sitting in the defendant box. Don't make eye contact with anybody. Look at the judge, acknowledge the judge when he speaks to you, but don't take your eyes off the judge. Because what happens is they usher in everybody in their orange jumpsuits and they're still in their, in their chains. And they come shuffling in and you're not allowed to look at them. Because they're not supposed to acknowledge you. You're not supposed to acknowledge them. Every, it's all about the judge. And so you sit there. And, and one of the things that I noticed that day, between the two different courts and, and all the things, is that some people have gotten stuck in a, in a cycle of hopelessness. What, what we saw was, and, and especially where we began to really notice it, was people who had just made some, some not very wise choices, just, just made some, some dumb choices and, and had gotten themselves in trouble, some of them very innocently. Uh, and, and they normally had to do with uh, substance abuse. They maybe had, had lost their license because they were drinking and driving, um, or they had been arrested for it, or, or they had been uh, pulled over and they happened to have drugs in their car, or, or there's all sorts of these things, and, and a lot of them were young, and a lot of them were in jobs where they just really weren't making a lot of money, maybe $8 an hour at McDonald's or something like that. And then what would happen is they would get arrested, and a lot of times when they got arrested, what would happen right off the bat is they'd lose their job. And then they would lose their license. And so even if they still had a job, they would eventually lose their job because they couldn't get to work because they couldn't drive themselves there if they were fortunate enough to have a car to begin with. So then they would come into court and they would be charged court fees for having to have come to court. And they don't have money 
for the court fees anymore. Every, everything that they do have, now they have to use to pay the court. And then they get told that what you have to do is you're going to have to participate in a group counseling session, like Alcoholics Anonymous or, or, or something like that. And, and now the problem is they don't have any way of getting there. And even if they do have a way of getting there, they can't afford it because a lot of the things that, that they're being told to go to are not free. And so they can't afford the counseling. And even if they can't afford a counseling, a lot of them we notice were single parents. Single parents trying to raise a family, $8 an hour working at McDonald's. They got, made, a, made a, a mistake, have ended up in getting arrested, have court fees, lost their job, have no way to get to the thing that they've been told to get to. They have nobody to watch their kids if they could go. Where the, where the problem begins to add up for people, and it becomes hopeless. And then what happens is they, they fail to participate in their court-appointed counseling, and so they end up getting arrested and then having to do time. And then when they are actually in jail, now, if they were a single parent, their children, if they're lucky enough, there might be some family that they can get farmed out to, but if they're not, they end up in another system. And so we sat back and we watched this. And I began to talk to some friends of mine, and it was interesting because the friends that I began to talk to, as we began to talk about how can we help these people, one thing I noticed is every single person that was interested in helping, they themselves had somebody that was caught in this system. Sometimes we just make bad decisions and we end up in places that we never expected. And so what we ended up doing is we created this ministry called The Net. And what The Net stood for was never expected this. It wasn't like this deep theological, you know, we're going to gather with the net and da-da-da, this and that. No, it was, man, I never expected this. And what we did is we said, okay, what is, what, what, are, what are keeping people from being able to pull themselves out of this situation? And so we identified the transportation problem. And so we went out and we spent $2,000 on a 15-person van. And by the grace of God, it passed inspection. And we decided we can use this to pick people up. Then we began to talk to friends that we had that were counselors. And lo and behold, there was actually a few out there that were willing to do it for free. And then we said, okay, we'll get them here. We now have free counseling. Let's feed everybody. Let them bring their whole family and we'll feed them. And then while they're in counseling, what was the other problem? Is who's going to watch their kids? Well, guess what? All of a sudden, those kids had more grandmas than you could imagine. We had so many people in the church that just came and, and hung out with the kids, and they'd play outside, and they'd do stuff. We had a few people that said, we should take this as an opportunity to do some educational stuff. And I said, or we can let them play on the playground. And so we decided to play on the playground. And we used to do this, and, and all of a sudden, what happened is people who were caught in a system where they couldn't see a way out, they all of a sudden had someone who was willing to reach in and pull them out. Because hopelessness means I cannot see my own way out. And it takes someone else to reach in and say, here's the way. And that's exactly what God did. God sat there and he watched and, and he was like, man, my people, they're just running around. And some of them realize they're in the darkness and they're trying to do things to get themselves out of that, but that's, that's fruitless, what they're doing. And then others, they don't even realize that they're in the darkness and, and they think that they're doing all right, but, but they're so lost. You know, we saw that when we began to work with this. There were some people that recognized that they had a need. And so they, you know, I, I remember one time we had show, we, we, I was driving the van that day and we came to a guy's house. He, had, he was, he's in the program. He was working it really well. And we got to his house and he wasn't there. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's, he's always here. You know, and I thought, oh man, did he, because if, because this guy, if he didn't show up to one counseling session, we had to report it and he was going back to jail. I was like, oh. And so I, we pick everybody else up. We're heading back to the church. And I see him on the side of the road walking towards the church. And I pull over. And I'm like, man, what are you doing? He's like, well, you were late. And I was like, I was only like five minutes late. And he's like, I know, but you were late. And I can't miss this. He goes, you don't realize how important this is to me. He goes, I knew I'd never make it there in time for the meal. But at least I'd be there for the counseling. I was like, well, get in. And so he jumped in. And so some people, they realize, man, they need the ride. 
And then you had others that would show up and their buddies would pull up and the music would be blaring and they'd jump out and they were so cool and they were so hard. And they didn't really need to be there, but man, the man was making them. And they'd come a few times and then they'd disappear and a couple months later, they'd show back up and had been arrested again. And sometimes it takes people a few times to run through the cycle before they realize they're actually caught in one. Right? And so Jesus, God looks down and he says, some people are running around, they don't even realize they're caught in the cycle, they don't realize they're lost. Uh, but there are some that are, are, are just trying so hard. But, but everybody needs something. And so what God does is he sends his son. He reaches down in the form of Jesus Christ to pull people out of their hopelessness. And then you and I that are sitting here today and calling ourselves Christians, we're some of those first ones maybe that recognized hopefully our hopelessness and that's why we're sitting here today. Um, Because what happens here is, is it says that John came first and John wasn't the light, but John pointed other people to the light. Right? And, and so the darkness, and, and you get this idea that in the darkness bumping around, all of a sudden there's a beam of light. Like J.D. was saying in the children's message, sometimes you just got to turn and you got to see that down the road there's light. And so Jesus is the light and, J- and John comes to proclaim the light. He himself isn't the light, but he turns people and he says, there it is right there. And the only way John can do that is because John is aware of his own need for the light. Because until... Until we are willing to uh, accept the grace and the mercy, we can't give the grace and the mercy. Because the grace and the mercy comes from God, and if we don't get it from God, we've got nothing to give. Are we aware this morning that we have that? I want to read this quote to you. It's, it's from... Uh, this theologian named Carl Jung, and he writes this, the acceptance of oneself in, is the essence of the whole moral problem and the epitome of a whole outlook on life. That I feed the hungry, that I forgive an insult, that I love my enemy in the name of Christ, all these are undoubtedly great virtues. What I do unto the least of my brethren, that I do unto Christ. But what if I should discover that the least among them all, the poorest of all the beggars, the most impudent of all the offenders, the very enemy himself, these are all within me. And that I myself stand in need of the alms of my own kindness. That I myself am the enemy who must be loved. What then? Before I'm asked to show compassion, I'm asked to accept it. And for order, in order for me to accept it, I have to realize that I'm not self-reliant. I have to rise above the desire to identify myself as being self-reliant. Because when we think we're self-reliant, it leads to a few problems. One of the problems is that if we're not careful, we begin to despise men and women who are not like us. We begin to think, well, the reason that they, you know, it's their own fault. The reason that they're in that position is their own fault. You know, maybe it would do them some good, maybe it would do them some good to spend some time in jail. Why don't they, why don't they just get a job? Why should I give them food? Why don't they just get a job? There's plenty of jobs out there. And we begin to, we begin to put ourselves on the judgment throne. And we begin to sit back and we begin to despise people who maybe are not as self-reliant as we think we are. We become almost incapable of receiving grace. Because why should I get it if I don't really need it? But if we do begin to understand that we are not self-reliant, we have to actually begin to give some things up. Like, for example, we have to give up the power of the guilt trip. We have to learn to not be threatened by the freedom of grace and cling to the law. We have to come to terms. Really, is this is what it's all about. We have to come to terms with who we are. This sermon series, The Poor, it's not about the others. It's about us. We are the poor. We are those in need of grace. 
And when we can come to that point, then we can be used as instruments of grace by God. I wrote this down, and I'm, it's, it's here on my notes, and, and I thought about this all week, and I thought, man, is this, is this too harsh? Is this, is this something I need to peel back from? Um, and I decided, you know what? No, it's something I needed to hear, and it's something I wanted to share with you, and this is it right here, that if I'm not able to identify the fact, if I'm not able to rise above the idea that I'm self-reliant, if I can't reach the point where I begin to identify myself as the poor, then perhaps I'm experiencing the greatest poverty of all, which is spiritual sickness. There's a story about these five businessmen who were on, they, they had gone to Chicago on business. And they all had families and, and friends, and, and they were from Milwaukee. And they had all come down together for this big sales meeting. And they were all eager to get home. They had, they had made the promises, we'll be home by a certain time. And they checked the train schedules, and they knew when they needed to be on the train. And the meeting ran a little over. And so they were rushing through the terminal, trying to get to, trying to, get to the train that would take them back to Milwaukee. And in their haste, they're running through, and they accidentally, I mean, it wasn't like they were just being jerks, they accidentally knocked into this table, and, and it was a table of a young blind boy who was sitting there, and he had these apples that he was selling, and he was trying to raise money to buy books for school, the Braille books, and, and he needed some clothes, and so he was trying to raise some money for himself so that he could go to school. And as they're running through, they knock his table over, and these apples go sprawling all over the place. And as I think about this scene, I imagine the boy hearing that the table's gone down, sensing what's happened, and, and he gets down on his hands and knees, and he starts, he starts to try to feel for where these apples are that are just now rolling all over the place. And one of the businessmen stops, and he yells to his friends. He's like, look, when you get back... Uh, my wife's going to be there waiting to pick me up, apologize to her, tell her I'll be on the next train. And so obviously this is before cell phones, right? But, but he tells them to do that. And he turns around and he goes back and he starts to help the boy pick up the apples. And then he stacks the apples back up and he goes through and he finds the ones that were bruised or broken uh, in the fall when they knocked them and they, and they went all over there. And he reaches into his pocket and he pays the boy for all the apples that he and his friends ruined. And as he turns to walk now down to where he's going to pick up his train, the boy shouts out. And he goes, excuse me, mister. Are you Jesus? And as I think about that story, I ask myself this question. When's the last time I was mistaken for Jesus? When's the last time that we were mistaken for Jesus. What we see is that hope comes because you hear the message and you begin to believe it because you begin to see it. And it leads to hope. We could tell people all day long about, about the program, the net, but until actually some people started coming through it and, and coming out of it, and getting jobs and not going back to court every few months. When that began to happen, then people started hearing about the net. And then people wanted to be in the net. You see, people can hear about Jesus all day long. But unless they begin to experience Jesus, there's no hope. John didn't just tell people about the light. He began to baptize them in it. There's a there's a, uh, a theologian, a Dutch theologian named Edward Schillebeek, and he writes this: Christianity is not a message which has to be believed, but an experience of faith that becomes a message. We can sit here and we can talk about this stuff, and we can be like, mm, yeah, I believe it. Sure. But the question isn't, do we believe the message? The question is, are we willing to be the message? 
Are we willing to live a certain way that brings people hope? Are we willing, are we willing to find, find ways that people are trapped and be able to reach in there and bring some light into darkness? It says, that, it says that God had sent John to proclaim the light. God still wants to reach down into lives and pour light into darkness. And he's still sending people to do that. Their names are you and me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.